Okay, good morning. Looks like we're recording, so we can go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the session two of our District 5000 Leadership Academy. I am so excited that today's session is about leadership. Um, I know that all of you are already very strong leaders in your community. I mean, really, all of you are people that are leaders that inspire me. Um, but I believe, and I hope that you believe this also, that leaders should never stop learning and trying to become better leaders for the people that they serve. Um, John Maxwell said, no matter where you are in your leadership journey, never forget that what got you to where you are won't get you to the next level. And, you know, our world is changing all around us. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Lee. And our world is changing all around us very rapidly right now. Um, and so the true test of leadership is how well you function in a crisis, right? And now more than ever, I know people hate that phrase, but now more than ever, we need strong leaders. Uh, crisis moments create opportunities because it forces us to focus on things outside the norm, but we need strong leaders to be able to help us get there. Um, it's very timely too, because I didn't realize that yesterday was boss's day. Um, so I walked into my office and I, um, my team knows I'm a leadership junkie. So they found all these leadership quotes and they made all these posters and they posted it all over my wall. So I'm looking at all these leadership quotes on my wall. So, um, but again, I want to thank all of you for stepping up to become the next generation of leaders for our district. We respect and appreciate all of you so much. Um, and speaking of great and fearless leaders, I'd like to introduce our great and fearless leader, our district governor, Naomi Masuno. Okay, I guess that was my lead in to introduce our main speaker, Ken Keith, Dr. Keith. And so I'd like to give you a little bit. So I hope you had a chance to read um, Ken's impressive bio, but to recap, um, Ken's a Rotarian since 1991. He's a current member of the Rotary Club of Sunrise, Honolulu Sunrise, born in New York, came to Hawaii, age 14, went to Stevenson Intermediate, who Rust School, and Roosevelt High School, where he was the student body president in his senior year. He earned his BA from Harvard, an MA from Oxford University in um, England, certificate in Japanese from Waseda University in Tokyo, Juris Doctor from University of Hawaii, Doctorate in Education on Higher educa Education Leadership from the University of Southern California. He's a Rhodes Scholar. But during his career, you know, he served as an attorney for Kate Shetty. He was the State of Hawaii Director of Planning and Economic Development, Manager of the Mililani Tech Center, uh, Tech Park, Senior VP, YMCA of Honolulu, President of Chaminade University. And you know, he walked away from this prestigious um, position to study and think. In 2007, he moved to Indiana to serve as CEO of the Greenleaf Center for Student Leadership, Servant Leadership, sorry. And in 2012, moved to Singapore, uh, where he served three years as CEO of the Greenleaf Center. 2015 to 2020, he served as the president for um, Pacific Rim uh, Christian University in Honolulu. But you know, you may have heard of the paradoxical commandment. Kent wrote this in 1968 as part of a booklet for student leaders. And Mother Teresa thought that this co paradoxical commandment was so important that she put it up on the wall at her children's center in Calcutta. And I'd like to read you some excerpts from uh, his book, from the paradoxical commandment um, that might apply to you as leaders. You have got the book. So people are illogical, unreasonable, and self-centered, love them anyway. If you do good, people will accuse you of selfish ulterior motives, do good anyway. The good you do today will be forgotten tomorrow, but do good anyway. The biggest men and women with the biggest ideas can be shot down by the smallest men and women with smallest minds. Think big anyway. Give the world the best you have and you'll get kicked in the teeth. Give the world the best you have anyway. So here to give us some words of wisdom, Kip Keith. 
Thank you, Naomi. I appreciate your, your kind introduction. So good morning, everybody. Uh, really is a pleasure to be with you this morning. I, I hope you're doing okay. I hope you're still safe and healthy. These are really challenging times now. I know you are uh, experienced Rotarians and Rotary leaders. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you've been living the Rotary model, that longtime mo motto, service above self. So I'd like to talk about servant leadership this morning because I think it's a great way to, to live that motto, service above self. Uh, I've met a lot of servant leaders uh, in Rotary. That's one of the things I love about Rotary. Uh, there are a lot of people with good heads and good hearts and they really are making a difference. Um, not only in Rotary, but in their families and their communities and at their places of work. So um, what is servant leadership? Well, the idea that leaders should serve others is an idea that actually goes back thousands of years. It can be found in a number of traditions, including the Rotary tradition. Uh, but there is a modern servant leadership movement, and uh, it was launched in the United States in 1970 by Robert K. Greenleaf who actually coined the English words servant leader and servant leadership for the first time uh, in his classic essay, The Servant as Leader. Greenleaf was born and raised in Indiana. He worked for AT&T for 38 years. That was from 1926 to 1964. And during those years, AT&T had a million employees. Turns out it was either the largest or one of the largest corporations in the entire world. He, um, he literally started at the bottom, digging holes for telephone poles. But he gradually worked his way up and eventually became the director of management research. So it was his job to figure out how to help the leaders and managers of the world's biggest corporation to be as effective as possible. So he noticed that there were leaders who were focused on acquiring power and wealth for themselves. And there were leaders who were focused on serving others, uh, their colleagues and their customers. And after 38 years of experience, uh, he concluded that the most effective leaders were those who focused on serving others. Greenleaf said that uh, servant leadership starts with a desire to serve, not the desire to lead. Of course, there are many ways to serve. So when a person with a desire to serve sees the opportunity to serve by leading, then that person accepts leadership responsibility and becomes a servant leader. Greenleaf focused on growing people because it is a triple win. When people grow, those individuals that are growing, they benefit uh, personally and professionally. Um, when they grow, their capacity grows, and that means the capacity of the organization grows. And when the capacity of the organization grows, that means the organization can do things better or do things it was never able to do before, which means better service uh, for customers, clients, patients, members, students, citizens, whoever is being served. So individuals benefit, the organization benefits, uh, and those served by the organization benefit. And that's why Greenleaf said the best test of servant leadership was this. Do those served grow as persons? Do they, while being served, become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, more likely themselves to become servants? And what is the effect on the least privileged in society? Will they benefit or at least not be further deprived? Now, I think the Rotary Clubs are great places to grow people. We can give club members the opportunity to contribute their knowledge and skill to club activities. We can mentor them and encourage them to grow in new ways ways that might not be available to them in their workplaces, for example. We can help them to grow as leaders within our clubs and that leadership experience will be good for them. And of course, it'd be good for the future of our clubs as well. The ultimate goal for Greenleaf was to make the world a better place. Servant leaders help their organizations to become servant institutions. Those servant institutions truly serve their employees, customers, business partners, creditors, members, shareholders, communities, society as a whole. As a result, the quality of our life improves and the world becomes a better place for everyone. My experience in looking out at the world is that there are two major models or paradigms or ideas about leadership. The dominant model is what I call the power model. According to the power model, leadership is about acquiring and wielding personal power. The other model that I see is the service model. The service model is about making a difference in the lives of others. So servant leaders live the power, excuse me, servant leaders live the service model of leadership. So a servant leader does not ask, how can I get power? How can I make people do things? The servant leader asks, what do people need? How can I help them to get it? What does my organization need to do? How can I help my organization to do it? So rather than embarking on a quest for personal power, the servant leader embarks upon a quest to identify and meet the needs of others. Uh, that's my best, short explanation of the mission of a servant leader. 
to identify and meet the needs of others. Basically, this is about paying attention. It's about paying attention to your colleagues and helping them get what they need to perform at their highest levels. It's about paying attention to those you serve, customers, clients, patients, members, students, helping them get what they need so they're happy and so your organization will be successful. Servant leadership is not soft. Servant leaders can and do make hard decisions whenever necessary in order to serve others. And servant leaders can exercise power, but when they exercise power, they usually exercise it with others, not over others. And they exercise it on behalf of others, not for their own personal gain. To a servant leader, power is only a tool, and it's usually not the most important tool. It's only a means and not an end. Servant leaders can be anybody, really political leaders, business leaders, nonprofit leaders, service club leaders, coaches, friends, neighbors. And they do most of the things that other leaders do. They, they articulate a vision, they manage, they communicate and so forth. What sets servant leaders apart from other leaders is that they are focused on others, not just themselves. And they're motivated to make life better for others, not just themselves. And that difference in focus and motivation is what really distinguishes servant leaders regardless of their titles or roles or positions. You know, in my uh, experience, this difference in focus and motivation is pretty easy to see in the questions people ask uh, when they make decisions every day. So a power-oriented leader who sits down to make a decision asks a different set of questions than a servant leader. A power-oriented leader will ask questions like this. What decision will enhance my power? What decision will make me look good? What decision will be a great way to get ahead of my chief rival? What decision will improve my relationship with my boss? What decision will position me better for my next promotion? So these are all power-oriented questions about the leader who is making the decision. A servant leader asks a different set of questions. A servant leader asks, what are the most important needs we should be addressing here? If we address this need, are we going to harm anybody? And if harm is likely, is there any way to mitigate it, to reduce that harm? What decision would be most consistent with the mission and values and goals of my organization? What decision would best serve our customers? So those are really different, a different kind of question and they're not about the leader. They're about the organization and the people that it serves. And this is where I think the four-way test uh, fits so perfectly. The questions asked in the rotary four-way test are questions that servant leaders do ask. They, they should ask and they do ask. You notice they're not questions about power, they're questions about how we treat other people. Uh, are we truthful with them? Are we being fair to them? Are we building good relationships with them? Are we sharing the benefits? Are we concerned that it'd be beneficial to all concerned? So those are the right questions for servant leaders. Now, when you ask these different sets of questions, you get different answers. And over time, the power-oriented leader and the servant leader move in different directions. The power-oriented leader moves toward getting things that she or he want personally, while the servant leader moves toward getting the things that other people need. And that's a big difference. You know, I, I love the fact that the idea of servant leadership grew out of Robert Greenlee's experience in a large competitive for-profit business. He was making a practical observation about what worked best for the business, and he knew that what worked best was servant leadership. For centuries, servant leaders have had uh, anecdotal evidence of the effectiveness of servant leadership. We know that servant leadership principles are being implemented in the public and sector, the private sector, and academic institutions, the military, nonprofit uh, organizations. Of course, every organization has its own culture and history and applies servant leadership principles in its own way. Uh, we know that for-profit companies that have implemented servant leadership principles have been financially successful. Many have been on the Fortune magazine list of the 100 best companies to work for in America. Uh, the companies I happen to know about personally, uh, Starbucks, the Container Store, Aflac, Sonovas Financial, Southwest Airlines, TD Industries, they're all on the Fortune um, list. While surprising to some people, I've met a number of military leaders who promote servant leadership. They focus on taking care of their troops. So a lot of great anecdotal evidence, but about 12 years ago, leadership scholars began to conduct empirically rigorous studies of servant leadership in the workplace. Uh, and the results have been very positive. For example, research has shown that servant leaders facilitate effective teamwork. Servant leadership enhances both job performance and commitment to the organization. Servant leaders inspire followers to serve the community in which the organization is located. 
Research has revealed that employees of servant leaders are more helping and more creative than those working with leaders who scored lower on servant leadership. Servant leadership has been shown to be positively related to employee job satisfaction. If you get good employees, you want to keep them. Back in 2012, Dr. Suzanne Peterson and her colleagues studied 126 chief executive officers in technology companies, high tech companies in Silicon Valley. So they interviewed these 126 CEOs at great length, and then they classified them into three groups, founders, narcissists, who would have thought, uh, and servant leaders. They found a positive relationship between servant leadership and firm performance. Companies led by servant leaders generated better financial results than companies led by founders uh, or narcissists, and the narcissists actually were the worst. The researchers have said that CEOs could improve their firm's performance if they adopted more inclusive forms of leadership, such as servant leadership, that take into account a broader number of stakeholders and are more other focused. There are studies uh, now being prepared for publication in academic journals that conclude that servant leadership is good for all stakeholders, including shareholders, because servant leadership increases the profitability of for-profit corporations. Dr. Bob Lydon, a professor of management at the University of Illinois at Chicago, will be publishing research that he and his team have conducted in South Korea. The study showed that as servant leadership goes up, profits go up. Other scholars, such as um, Dr. Lemoyne, have been uh, doing other research in the United States and they've been getting similar results. When servant leadership goes up, profits go up. So anecdotal evidence and empirical research make it clear that servant leadership works, but, but why does it work? Well, why wouldn't it work? I mean, <laughs> think about it. Servant leaders identify and meet the needs of others. They identify and meet the needs of their colleagues so they can perform at their highest levels. They identify and meet the needs of their customers so that they will be truly served. I mean, colleagues perform well, customers get what they need. Why wouldn't that work? And when you think about it, it's, it's pretty simple. Of course, there are specific leadership practices that help servant leaders to be effective. For example, in my own writing and speaking, I talk about self-awareness, listening, changing the pyramid, developing your colleagues, coaching, not controlling, unleashing the energy and intelligence of others, and foresight. Now, those are seven key practices um, that I like to, to share. I think that listening um, is, is crucial to every organization, uh, certainly is crucial to our work in Rotary. We serve our local communities and we serve communities in other parts of the world. How do we know that we're providing the kind of programs and services that people really need? Well, we start by asking and listening. What do people say they want and need? What are their hopes and dreams? Is there a way that we can help? Sadly, people of goodwill and good intentions can spend a lot of time and money doing things that people don't need. Uh, we tend to do what we want to do and know how to do, even if others don't need us to do it. So whether it's in our local community or a community on the other side of the world, the challenge is to make sure that we did enough asking and listening up front so we don't waste our time and effort or even harm people unintentionally when we're trying to help them. Uh, there are a bunch of examples. Here's, here's a little one. This is a simple little example. A group of Americans wanted to help an orphanage in Asia. They felt really bad that children only had mats to sleep on instead of beds. So they shipped a bunch of bunk beds to the children. What they didn't know was that the children preferred to sleep on mats because they could roll them up and put them against the wall during the day. And that opened up the full room as a play space, which was especially valuable when it rained. So now the bunk beds filled each room and left very little space for anybody to play. Beyond key practices like listening, there are attitudes and practices that help servant leaders to be effective. I'd like to talk about just two of them. First, servant leaders go beyond extrinsic motivation to emphasize intrinsic motivation. And second, servant leaders promote meaning at work. I see these two attitudes and practices as important foundations for success. So I'd like to take a look at each of these. One reason that servant leadership works so well is that servant leaders do focus on intrinsic motivation. People who are intrinsically motivated perform better than those who are extrinsically motivated. So we know the difference, right? I mean, extrinsic motivation is about what you have to do, not what you want to do. Well, the task needs to be done, but it's not fun or interesting or fulfilling or meaningful. So managers will offer incentives or threats of punishment um, to get the task done. They tell people, if you do this, you will get that. 
and that is a reward or threat of punishment that is not really related to the work itself. Intrinsic motivation is the opposite. I mean, it's about what you want to do, not what you have to do. Um, people are intrinsically motivated when, they're, when they do something because it is fun or interesting or fulfilling or meaningful. When you're intrinsically motivated, the work itself is your reward. So we don't say, if you do this, we'll give you that. We say, if you do this, you'll like it. It'll be fun. It'll be interesting. One of the most read articles in the history of the Harvard Business Review was an article by Frederick Hertzberg published in 1968 titled, One More Time, How Do You Motivate Employees? Hertzberg argued that some factors are hygiene factors and others are intrinsic motivators. Hygiene factors are company policy and administration, supervision, relationship with a supervisor, work conditions, salary, relationships with peers, personal life, relationships with subordinates, status, security, all those things that surround us at work. Hertzberg said these factors are the primary cause of extreme dissatisfaction on the job. Employers need to get these factors right so employees will not be dissatisfied. However, more and better hygiene factors will not produce extreme satisfaction. Only intrinsic motivators will do that. Those intrinsic motivators include achievement, recognition, the work itself, responsibility, advancement, and growth. The hygiene factors and intrinsic motivators are not the opposite of each other. They represent different needs. They are both important, but if you want high levels of performance, your colleagues need to be intrinsically motivated. In his research, Dr. Kenneth W. Thomas identified a sense of meaning as an important intrinsic reward at work. Meaning at work turns out to be a huge bottom line issue that I think gets comparatively little attention. Common sense tells us that if you find meaning in your work and you're intrinsically motivated, you will be able to do more and do it better for longer. It's really nice though when a scholar comes along and does empirical research that supports common sense. Uh, Dr. Adam Grant um, did that. Dr. Adam Grant uh, is a professor at the Wharton School. He explored this issue. He separated pro-social motivation and intrinsic motivation to study their effects, if any, on each other. He defined pro-social motivation as a desire to benefit or help others to serve a greater purpose. He said that intrinsic motivation comes from interest in the work or the enjoyment of doing the work. So Dr. Grant went out and he studied 140 workers at a telephone call center and 58 employees at a fire department. He focused on the issues of persistence, performance, and productivity. Uh, those are all desirable things. Grant concluded that employees display higher levels of persistence, performance, and productivity when they experience pro-social motivation and intrinsic motivation together, when people want to help or serve a greater purpose and they find the work interesting or enjoyable. Well, that matches what Greenleaf said about servant leadership. Greenleaf said that servant leadership starts with a desire to serve, to benefit others, and that's the pro-social motivation. Greenleaf also emphasized growth and meaning, and that's the intrinsic motivation. When you put the two together, you get the result that Grant showed in his research, higher levels of persistence, performance, and productivity. Servant leaders know that meaning is an intrinsic motivator, so they do their best to enhance meaning at work. Meaningful work was central to Greenleaf's business ethic. This is his business ethic. He said the work exists for the person as much as the person exists for the work. Put another way, the business exists as much to provide meaningful work to the person as it exists to provide a product or service to the customer. That business ethic turns out to be very practical in terms of employee performance, commitment, and satisfaction. So how important is meaning at work? Well, Catherine Bailey and Adrian Madden interviewed 135 people in the United Kingdom who work in a variety of occupations. They published their results in an article in the MIT Sloan Management Review titled, What Makes Work Meaningful or Meaningless? They said that the research shows that meaningfulness is more important to employees than any other aspect of work. I'd like to repeat that. Meaningfulness is more important to employees than any other aspect of work. It's more important to employees than pay and rewards, opportunities for promotion or working conditions. Their results are consistent with Grant's findings. Bailey and Madden said that meaningful work can be highly motivational, leading to improved employee performance, 
commitment, and satisfaction. Those are things we want to promote, right? Improved performance, commitment, and satisfaction. Those are things that eventually affect the bottom line. Because meaning is so important, servant leaders do whatever they can to create an environment in which meaning is enhanced for their colleagues. Servant leaders find meaning in the work of others and share that meaning with them, help them to notice it as they are doing it. Servant leaders seek to redesign work when necessary to make it more meaningful. I think there's a special opportunity here for, for leaders in Rotary because we have flexibility in our programs and projects. Rotary leaders can listen to club members and, and learn about their interests, their goals, their dreams. Our role as leaders can be to facilitate what they would like to do. You don't have to sell an idea to people if the idea is theirs to begin with. Uh, they already have the meaning and motivation. So your, your role is to help them uh, help to make it all happen, to help them reach their goals and even fulfill their dreams. And I think that would give you a lot of meaning, the kind of meaning that will sustain you in your leadership. So the modern servant leadership movement was launched by a businessman who concluded that servant leaders were more effective and got better business results than power oriented leaders. We have anecdotal evidence and empirical research that demonstrate that servant leadership works well for all stakeholders. There are key practices that help servant leaders to be effective. Servant leaders also promote intrinsic motivation, enhance the meaning and purpose of their people, of their people to help them perform at their highest levels. We have special opportunities in Rotary to help people contribute their knowledge and skill to grow and to lead. We have special opportunities to help club members undertake programs and projects that motivate them and are meaningful to them. Um, if we are good at listening, the things that they really want to do will be things that others really need um, and it'll be a triple win. I'd like to close by saying that I think servant leadership is what most of us would just call good leadership it's just good leadership. I believe that we need many, many more servant leaders in our organizations and communities. We'll have more servant leaders if we establish the service model as the accepted standard of leadership. We'll have more servant leaders if we teach our young people about the service model. And we'll have more servant leaders if we continue to demonstrate the service model in each of our own lives. That after all is at the core of the Rotary tradition our commitment to service can assure a strong future for our families, our organizations, and the nation we love. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kent. Um, I hope that uh, gave us some uh, insight, everybody, but you are all leaders too, so this really helps in, in getting us uh, a little bit further along. So. Um, uh, Wendy, do we have time for questions or no time? Um, we're running a little, maybe one question. Okay, one is, question. Is Kent, are you going to be able to stay with us or are you? Um, I can stay a while. Okay. Um, so maybe we could do questions or does someone have a question right now? That they'd like to ask? Okay. Question. Real quick. Um, yeah, real quick. So yeah, thanks, Ken. Um, you know, I was kind of curious because I really like your what you're talking about. There's a good book that I wanted to share with the group called Drive by Daniel H. King. Yep. Uh, I've been using that with my um, team members for a very long time. That works really, really well. Um, but I was curious, you know, what books would you recommend for Robert K. Greenleaf? There's a bunch of books I see here and I would like to start reading one. Right, well, the, the Modern Servant Leadership was launched by his essay called The Servant as Leader. And it's fairly abstract and philosophical. And uh, so I was asked if I could uh, break down some of the long sentences and make them shorter. And so there's, a, there's an edited edition that's a little easier to read and it's called The Contemporary Servant as Leader. It's available on, on Amazon. And I also asked some people in the servant leadership movement to comment on different sections that they wanted to comment on. So it's a little bit of a, of a discussion, almost like a little bit of a panel discussion as well. So that would be, I think, a good place to start. That's awesome. Thank you. And you know, before Kent, before you leave, we'd like to take a group photo with you in there. <laughs> if everyone could just look at the camera real quick. Okay, one, two, three. Okay. Um, if you're able to stay with us, I mean, if you know someone has a question at the end, um, but I do want to um, pivot to our instructor now. We are. Um, but again, thank you, Keith, for that amazing um, presentation. It is so 
true to what we do here as Rotarians and as leaders. Um, I'd like to introduce our instructor, Dr. Carol Riley, is a past president of our of the Rotary Club of Waikiki and has a long accomplished career in education, working as a principal, superintendent of schools, a head of school, and as a professor teaching organizational leadership. So please welcome Dr. Carol Riley. And thank you guys very much. I'm going to try to share my screen one more time. And I think it is working. One more click. Yes, and we're ready to go. So we're gonna start out by taking a quick quiz. Now, I'm wondering how you're all feeling about this program right now. You have three choices. One, I feel confused, but I think I can get it. Two, my mom told me never to quit. I know I have to dive deeper. Or three, no doubt, I know that I can do this. I want you to please in the chat box, post your numbers one, two, or three. Right now, post away. And you know what? On my Zoom screen, I cannot see the chat box. <laughs> I'm not that good. So I'm gonna ask Dave Hamill, what numbers do you see? What's being posted? Well, they are almost all threes. Perfect. Carol. And you know what, Dave Hamill, I'm not surprised because I know looking at the names of the people with us today, we have a group of wonderful leaders. So thank you guys for doing that. Moving ahead, I asked you all to look for leadership quotes. And I wanna thank Wendy for mentioning that to us at the very beginning of our presentation today. So let's do some group sharing of quotes we found and tell us why you like them. We don't have time to hear from everyone, so I'm just gonna call people. If you don't wanna play my game, say pass, and I'll go to somebody else. Okay, let's start with James. What'd you find, James? Uh, carry a big stick. <laughs> Why did you like that? Uh, well, it, it was it was actually just the first on my list here. Honestly, I got put on the spot. But uh, uh, well, it, it, I think it has uh, it has for me it has different meaning. I think the, the initial intent that I think Teddy Roosevelt or I guess was walk with a big stick, right? Was uh, was more or less uh, you know to kind of uh, you know show uh, confidence and whack people on the head if they don't listen to you, right? But I think of it differently. I think of it as uh, the stick is uh, part of a burden and uh, you're carrying the big stick because uh, you're showing leading by example and you're actually are, are walking with the stick. And uh, I guess if it's a, it's a if, I guess if it's a company that uh, makes sticks, I guess it's, it's a perfect example for someone who carries the biggest stick uh, is the one that should be the leader. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Thank you very much. And you are a good person to go first. Um, let's follow up with Lane. What you got? Yeah. Hi, Carol. Good seeing you again. Um, I chose uh, people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. If you talk about what you believe, you will attract those who believe what you believe. And I picked that because, you know, I think, you know, for, for even in our, in my business and in Rotary, um, we want to attract people that believe in what we believe in. And that's one of the things that we really want to have, you know, our people in Rotary just believing in what we believe in, whether it's helping the homeless or, you know, eradicating polio. So that's why I picked it. Okay, excellent. Uh, Mariko, what do you have? Okay, I chose something a little different from, um, from Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu was the uh, philosopher, Chinese philosopher from um, sixth century or five century, nobody knows, in BC, so that long time ago. So it's, I, I think it's probably one of the, the original servant leader 
leadership advocate. So he said, to lead people, walk behind them. A leader is best when people barely know he exists. When his work is done, his aim fulfilled, they will say, we did it ourselves. Excellent. So, Go ahead, you were saying something else. No, no, no. Uh, well, you know, uh, Lao Tzu was uh, the founder of the Taoism, you know, the uh, philosophical Taoism. And uh, he emphasized, you know, the, uh, the compassion, frugality, and humility. And I really like those uh, philosophy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for sharing with us. Uh, let's do another one. Conrad, what do you have? Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my leadership quote comes from uh, what uh, I've learned at my workplace here in uh, real estate. It's called the bold laws. And one of the bold laws is there are results and there are reasons and you can't have both. So as leaders, we need to create results and not be a victim, uh, play a victim role uh, as to why things are not moving forward and things like that. Okay, tell me more about the reasons part. Well, reasons is uh, obviously uh, excuses, right? And things like that. So uh, as opposed to results, right? Which is um, making things happen, making a difference and, and things like that. So you either are gonna have results or reasons and you just can't have both. Got it, got it, thank you. That's great. Uh, let's do one more, Dick, what do you have? I actually uh, had two because I thought they were both appropriate. I will give you one because it talks to recognizing the importance of relatively small things that individual Rotarians do, giving them feedback for them so that they're encouraged to continue doing great things. As from Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa, your ordinary acts of love and hope point to the extraordinary promise that every human life is of inestimable value. The other one is from Teddy Roosevelt, and James quoted a very famous quote. Teddy Roosevelt's an interesting guy, controversial in some ways, but he did lead from out in front. And the quote of his that I liked was, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And that gets back to our, the why, leading from the inside out. Thanks. And that why question is always so important. Yep. Thank you for sharing that. But this is too much fun. Uh, Kelly, I'm gonna ask you, what'd you get? Is Kelly here? Okay, Sean. Kelly, you, we weren't hearing you. Oh, thank you. I don't see, I don't see any of that stuff. Yeah, he was trying to talk, but we couldn't hear him. Okay. I'm, I'm uh, is Kelly going or am I going? Either way. Sean, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, my quote, wait, let me grab it again, was uh, 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 from Ralph Nader, and he says, the, the purpose of leadership is to create more leaders, not to create more followers. So I like that because I like the idea of empowering the people that, um, you know, that, that you're in, you, you, it, under, under your leadership if that makes sense. So yeah, to me, that's a, a personal thing. And I, and, I, and I think that if, if clubs approach leadership development that way, there wouldn't be a big push for everybody to be like, oh man, you know, you're going to do PE, you're crazy. You know, instead they'd be like, oh, that's a natural progression. Everybody wants to be the president elect, you know what I mean? So anyway. Oh, Sean, I think that's absolutely perfectly correct. Thank you very much. Uh, Scott, what'd you get? Uh, I'm gonna go with um, I'm gonna go with a quote. I'm gonna, I got two. This is from Yoda, and <laughs> do or do not. There is no try. <laughs> this is Yoda from Star Wars. For those that may not know, That's good. And the one that I really liked was in a dark place we find ourselves, and a little more knowledge lights our way. Okay. Good. Very, very good. Uh, Doug. 
You might want to see if Kelly, I think Kelly unmuted himself. Kelly, Kelly with us now? Kelly? No, I think we still can't hear him, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, Doug. No, Doug? Uh, I, wish, I wish I could read lips and I could tell, then I could tell Kelly's for him. <laughs> I'm feeling a little bit bad for Kelly. Um, anyway, uh, the, um, I have these quotes all over the wall, unfortunately. Um, but I think I'm going to go with the one that um, my son told, tells his son, which is, listen, tell the truth, work hard, be good. Good. Very basic and very powerful. Dave Hamill. Well, um, I purposely look for a quote from a woman leader, uh, past President Carol. Very good, um, I like that about you. So this is uh, Mary Barra, who uh, was the CEO of General Motors. And I thought it was in theme with the uh, leadership uh, uh, tasks that we had this, uh, for this session. It's okay to admit what you don't know. It's okay to ask for help. And it's more than okay to listen you to the people. Stop. It? Sure, I'm stopped. I, Shall I start again? I don't know. Who yeah, Dave, I didn't, I didn't hear the last part of what you said, Dave. Okay. So it's okay to admit what you don't know. It's okay to ask for help. And it's more than okay to listen to the people you lead. In fact, it's essential. Perfect. So true. And our last one, Ted, what do you have? Uh, my quote came from John Quincy Adams, and he said, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. And I picked that one because of the focus around action and how actions can help to inspire others and to enable them to do more. Excellent, excellent. Thank you guys. You all get an A, that was perfect. Okay, the next slide is about primary leadership styles. My goodness gracious, Dr. Keith, if you're still here, I'm so glad you shared with us this morning about servant leadership truly is what Rotary is all about. When I went online, I saw seven different styles, four styles, eight styles. You can also take a leadership style test, a quiz to see which one you sense to seem to favor. If you've never done that, it would be fun. Just go to the internet, leadership style survey, and you'll find it. Now, let's talk just a minute about emotional intelligence. You know, this first came into being in 1962. It actually became very popular in 1989 when people started doing a lot of research about emotional intelligence quickly. What is it? Number one, it's self-awareness. It's recognizing and understanding your personal emotions. Two, self-regulation. That's about being able to control and redirecting your impulsive emotions. Motivation is a big piece here. And this is a desire and a willingness to act. And as we learned today from Dr. Keith, we need to be intrinsically motivated. Empathy is we have to understand the emotional needs of others and we have to treat them accordingly. Social skills is a piece here. This is all about managing relationships, building networks, finding common ground, and building rapport. The important piece with emotional intelligence is emotions do matter. 
They affect relationship quality, decision-making, physical and emotional health. Very, very, very important. We don't have time to do that. So we're gonna move on to collaboration. We all know that we cannot do it alone. We have to work with people. Sometimes it's easier to work with a group than it is with another group. So what makes it easy? Here are seven points we need to remember. First of all, the group needs to have a common purpose, a common goal. And you need to talk about that. You've got to build a sense of trust with everybody. Really important to clarify roles from the very start. Communication, of course, is important. It needs to be open and it needs to be effective. We've got to remember to appreciate a diversity of ideas. Conflict is a big piece here. Whenever you have more than one person, you have a chance of having conflict. If you have it, it needs to be open and it needs to be dealt with directly. Most importantly, you have to have a sense of joy in working with each other. If you can do all of these things, chances are you're going to be successful with collaboration. There are a lot of collaboration tools that leaders can use. Michael Machalko wrote a book in 2006. The title of his book was Thinker Toys. In this book, he's got hundreds of different tools you can use. I just highlighted several for you. I want to talk about TikTok. You have two columns, the tick column and the talk column. In the tick column, you write down negative things about the situation, about the problem, negative things. Then you switch to the talk column. You switch around that negative thing and make it something positive. The purpose here is to overcome fears, doubts, and uncertainties. I liked Dukes of Habit. So often, we all do everything the same way. We feel everything needs to be in its place. The problem is, if we are Dukes of Habit, we're limited in our problem-solving abilities. So. We need to change things up. We got to get out of the box. And I love the other one. Sometimes we should just throw the box away. I'm sure most of us have done squat, splint, spin the dot. We do a lot. And then Einstein's paradox. This was real great because Dr. Keith talked to us about paradoxal uh, commandments. And these are things like win by losing, seek diversity, but build a shared vision. <laughs> Two opposites together and make it work. Collaboration tools. Okay, so we work really hard. We've got a team together. We got a plan. We're working hard, but something is wrong. It's not working. What's going on? Again, Patrick Lencioni wrote a book. This was in 2002. The name of his book is Five Team Dysfunctions. He listed five reasons why you might be having difficulty. The first one is not surprising. We saw it before. There's an absence of trust. And I think we all understand that one. There's a fear of conflict. I think some people think, geez, I don't wanna say anything negative because I don't wanna be causing a problem for anyone. Somebody might think, 
I shouldn't say anything because I don't want people to think I'm a know-it-all. There's a real fear of having conflict. The third possibility is a lack of commitment. And this might be because we were unclear on what our goal was at the very beginning. Fourth, there could be an avoidance of accountability. Some people in a group may think, sure, I can be here, but I don't want to be responsible for anything. Or there can be inattention to results, not paying attention to what happens, thinking, you know what, I'm really very busy. I've got other things to do. And you know what? Life is going to go on, so it really doesn't matter what happens. Okay? Five team dysfunctions. Now, I want you to think about your club. <clears throat> Do you see any of these dysfunctions in your club? Which ones? Why do you think they're there? Absence of trust. Definitely see that. And why do you think that's so? Um, that just happened recently, a couple months ago. Don't want to get too much into it, but there was an absence of trust between two members. And uh, what ended up happening is a member that was with their club for a couple of years decided to walk away and it caused it caused some conflict with um, other club members taking sides. So that was an absence of trust of not trusting. They should trust that, you know, the other person meant well, but it didn't turn out the way that you know, right. you were perceiving it. Great, great example. Anybody else, do you have one? Well, I think the inattention to results, the, you know, what, how is it that anything actually gets done? You know, when we talk about a success, who's accountable for it and what are the kind of underlying things that made happen? It just, the fact that we got a district grant or had a collaboration doesn't happen by accident. It requires some intentionality, some participation, some work, and some follow through. I'm happy to report the results, but there's a, an abject disconnect between how we got there uh, and, and what allowed that success to happen. You know, Kelly, I think that is so true. And I'm wondering in clubs, do we celebrate our successes together as a club? Do we all realize that's what it takes? Thanks for sharing that. Anybody else? Yeah, Carol, I don't have anything to share because our club is perfect. <laughs> well, you've had really good presidents in your club. I know uh, that. I know that's true. <laughs> Carol, I can uh, comment on avoidance of accountability. Yes, please. Uh, we have uh, most of our clubs where half the members are truly engaged and do um, almost all the work. And usually about half the members are um, either rarely seen or they come to meetings and eat burp and leave. Uh, right. So there's a mismatch in their either a mismatch in their expectations or a mismatch in uh, what Rotary is delivering against their expectations that they're not more involved and accountable to the rest of the club. I think that that's a good point. And I think a lot of times there truly is a misunderstanding of what we're all about. We need to pay attention to that. Thank you for sharing. We had Anybody? one. Go ahead. Uh, we had one, and, and it, uh, it related to lack of commitment. Uh, we worked through the problem, but let me go back to earlier when we talked about establishing a clear purpose for a meeting, and this was at a board meeting, and, and this meeting was to decide how to allocate some funds that we had. Uh, one of the board members came to the meeting with a very clear idea of what the pet project they had was and how they wished to see those funds allocated. But as the discussion took place, it appeared that a majority of the folks wanted to use the funds for another purpose. Ultimately, that was decided, but maybe without thoroughly airing the options. So when we got to the point where 
we continued from there. It was obvious that the person who had brought an idea that was not adopted was still present, but no longer committed to the process. In other words, I don't want to walk away, but, but, I, but my heart is not in this. So we met with them privately and talked about how we can go through working to fund the project they were interested in, how we could work that in the fullness of time. And uh, sure enough, they came back and were good participants. But had we let that go on, they were there, they were present, but they were really not, didn't have their heart in where we were headed. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. You know, guys, this is all about learning. And I really liked what I heard early, earlier um, saying that leadership stops when learning stops. And, you know, I am learning so much right now just listening to your reflections. It's a great way to learn. And I want to thank you all for sharing. Before we get into the crucial conversations, let me just say that we all know traditional leadership model, the old model doesn't work anymore. It's archaic. It used to just be you needed to manage workers. That's not the way it is anymore. I think it's important that we remember Maslow's hierarchy. You know that, that big diamond that he showed us and at the very top is self actualization That's what people really want to have. Leaders need to make sure they're able to get there. It's important. I also like to think about engagement. So many times when I hear people talking about clubs and what they need, what I hear is, our members need to be more engaged. We need to remember that engagement is truly a desire of the heart. That causes us to engage. So this gets us to crucial conversations. This is a big, 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 big piece. And when I first learned about this, I thought, God, why did it take me so long to understand this? You know, these are conversations that we don't really want to have. They don't feel good, but we know it's important that we have them. They need to be open. They need to be honest for the good of our organization, for what we're trying to do for our community. So if we decide we need to have a crucial conversation, how do we do it? First of all, you have to start with the heart. There's another book I will just recommend to you. The name of the book is Lead from the Heart. It was by Mark Crowley and he wrote this in 2011. It's excellent if you get a chance, take a look at it. He says you gotta start with the heart. You have to, first of all, connect with the person you're talking to, or if it's a group, the people you're talking to. It needs to be a personal conversation. You also, at the beginning, need to express your gratitude to them for participating. Throughout the whole conversation, you've got to focus on the other people. The second piece is you have to learn to look. Listening is real important. We know that, but looking is also important. You can look to see how people are reacting to what you're saying. There's a lot of communication that is nonverbal and you will see that if you're looking you have to be sure to make it safe. You think about the location. Where are we gonna have this conversation? Some places are safer than others. Master your story. You have to know where you come from on this issue and why you come from that 
place. You've got to share that openly and honestly. They need to understand where you are. They'll understand if you master your story. Then you get to the point that in a perfect world, given where I am, this is what I'd like to see happen. Share your thoughts. It's not enough to stop there. You got to hear from everybody. Where are they? You have to ask questions to get them to talk to you about where they are and why they're there. To have open, honest conversation. Once you've had that, you need to say, wow, we have a lot to think about. But you know what? We got to make some decisions on what to do. We have to move to action. Somebody's going to say, yeah, but you know what? We tried that years ago and it didn't work. Yeah, you're right. But you know what? It's a different time. We're different people. We have different motivation. Maybe we just need to try it again. Then together, you've got to make a decision and put it all together. These are crucial conversations. These are conversations that you need to have at home, sometimes with your family, at work, with your Rotary Club. All of these things, crucial conversations. So let's do an application on this topic. Again, thinking about your club. Are crucial conversations ever held? If so, please tell us about one and tell us the results of that conversation. Can you think of anything? I know you've had some. Hey, hey. Uh, hey I just wanted to, uh, just with the, with the current election coming up, uh, this happened again, uh, this also happened back in 2016, but I think, uh, Unfortunately, the election has divided a lot of Rotary Clubs. And I think uh, one crucial conversation we had, especially with, uh, you know, it seems like some, some of the members feel that because they're uh, contributing a lot of money to the club, that they should be able to, they, they could uh, voice whatever opinion they want about politics or whatnot, especially doing Aloha dollars, things like that. And I think, uh, unfortunately, back in 2016, we actually lost a few members. Uh, um, I'm not sure if this is the exact reason why, but this, that's what was voiced uh, was because of the, um, the kind of the, some of the nasty comments that are said back and forth across the, the aisle, if you will. So uh, just recently, we had a, a pretty hard conversation about uh, keeping politics out of Rotary and uh, even something as simple as uh, polio eradication and saying that, uh, you know, science and the WHO and these kinds of terms seem to be very uh, politically charged these days, which uh, last year they weren't. And unfortunately, uh, that has kind of uh, even even saying that we're eradicating polio and using the World Health Organization has become a politically charged kind of comment too. So it's so it's kind of hard, but we had a good conversation. And we just we said, you know, what's what's said is not necessarily intended to be political. And I think uh, that was kind of the biggest uh, kind, of, kind of hard conversations we had in our club was was just making sure that people are more mindful of others. And uh, as as a, a leader and as a past leader, it was just kind of hard for me to um, kind of. Um, get get organized especially in a club like mine which is a uh, majority of the club has already been past present already so it's just kind of hard to kind of get that message across right well thank you for sharing that one and so did you start that conversation who started it i i, I did not it was actually uh it, was, it seems it seems to be going on for the last four years honestly Carol. <laughs> so i don't know who actually started it but uh i, I would say it started uh after a couple exit interviews back in 2016 um and it's just been kind of lingering, and I think just more so with uh, uh, with a lot of the rhetoric. And I think it's a little bit easier, in my opinion, with uh, Zoom, primarily because uh, uh, the president can uh, mute things or pause things or control things a little bit more during some of these uh, meetings. And you know, not to not to kind of uh, spill too much of the dirt in our club, but uh, you know, like we've uh, we've done a good job with that way, uh, especially with Zoom. But uh, uh, yeah, I don't know who started the conversation. I I I I restarted the conversation. I guess if that's the uh, you know you know, in, I think to restart it was kind of hard primarily because of, uh, of um, I, I honestly, there's a handful of members, I don't know where they lie on the pol uh, on the politics, which is good, you know, that's how it should be. And I think that was, that was kind of helpful. And I think finding some of these neutral members and kind of leaning towards them and, and finding these neutral, I guess, leaders as well, 
and asking them for advice and then moving forward uh, with a decision that uh, collectively we actually decided that uh, we should just keep the politics out. And, and we've, we finally, I think, have come to a conclusion, but uh, we'll see what happens in the next few weeks. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, I, I think that that was a great one to share. And I think that's one that's probably a real possibility in all of our clubs. So thank you for sharing that one. Anybody else have one? Or the second piece here, oh. if, oh, go ahead, somebody. I was just gonna say, we had a conversation, we were approached a number of years ago, our club about um, wanting to merge with another smaller club that's in our area. And, and though we've collaborated with them on projects and I think personally like them, um, you know, outside of Rotary, I think the, the, we invited them to apply if they wanted to, you know, they're, if they were intent on folding their charter, their individual members could come and apply. Uh, but we weren't, we wanted to make sure that our process wasn't, would protect the identity and the, the culture of the club that we had built. And we weren't simply going to layer upon you know, as kind of an Oreo that there would be two sort of discrete layers that were very um, different in the way they were oriented. And it was, and it was difficult to share that conversation back with fellow Rotarians. And it was a little difficult to have in our club because we wanted to, you know, support and be uh, appreciative of, you know, and it was flattering that people would want to join, but, you know, thinking about the potential downline consequence and what that would mean for who we are and our integrity and our values was ultimately the more abiding principle that people stood by. Well, sure, and you have to think about that sovereign as well, Kelly. So thank you for sharing that one with us. Anybody else? Then the only other question I have here is if you were to hold one in the near future, what would it be about and who would be involved? Does anything come to mind? Don't need specifics. One of one of our, um, if if I could volunteer, one of our discussions that we're already kind of broaching, but really haven't, but is um, once it's you know quote unquote okay to meet with you know because our club's about twenty five people. When they say, oh well, we could meet in person with twenty five people, how many people are comfortable with that, and how many people are going to feel excluded if we move? to a, you know, physically meeting in person when everybody's really been enjoying the Zoom and we don't want to, we don't want people to be like, you know, but ultimately that's what our club started out, you know, has been for 20 plus years is, you know, we physically meet somewhere. Um, but I will say some people really enjoy the convenience of the Zoom meetings. So it's, it's like, well, where do we go from here when after coronavirus, we can like, is this gonna fundamentally change the structure of the way our club meets from here on out? So that's kind of a crucial conversation. And then some people are like, well, you know, just cause we can't get back together. I've got a bunch of health problems. I don't wanna meet. So anyway. And I, I think that's probably a crucial conversation that a lot of us will be having. I know in my club, we've talked a little bit about that in terms of the future when we can meet together are we gonna do it the same way we've always done it? Or are we gonna make some modifications? Just like you said, some people really do like the Zoom meetings. So maybe there needs to be a combination of something and that's going to require a crucial conversation. Good conversation there. So now the second takeaway from your pre-assignment. Remember I asked you to take a look at a couple of YouTube videos. And I'd like you to talk to us about one of them, what it was about, what you got from the video and why it was important to you. Um, and again, if you wanna pass, just let me know. Dave Livingston, can you start for us? No, because I didn't do the videos. I've been a bad person this week. Dave Livingston, and I was going to really, at the beginning of this talk, I was going to thank you so much for inviting me to my very first Rotary meeting. And you <laughs> didn't do your homework. Well, see, so I get a pass because I got you in your Rotary, so I'm good for the rest of my life. Okay. I'm you get correct to do any assignment again. Okay. No, I was actually, uh, I was, uh, to tell you the truth, I, that uh, 
whole thing about service, I found out that an elementary school uh, wouldn't have class pictures this year because photographers won't show. So my brother-in-law and I spent all day yesterday at Navy Holly Cakey School doing the kids' class photos. And we volunteered about 204 kids and 25 classes. And uh, I got to tell you, it was one of the best days of my life. But then I was up until 2 o'clock this morning writing things we're saving. And I haven't had time to do any homework. So I apologize for not being the best Rotarian in the world, but I am a good community servant. Thank you. Dave, Dave, I'll tell you what, you are absolutely one of the best I've ever known. This guy told me one reason he thinks he's been so successful with all he does is because he never says no to anybody. And you were busy taking those pictures, so you're absolutely forgiven. Okay. And uh, Dr. Ham, can you talk to us about one of the uh, videos? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I guess uh, Simon Sinek, uh, I guess had a good uh, TED talk and it's, it's interesting that was brought up because uh, that's kind of uh, when I got out of the military, I, you know, I started this little nonprofit that goes to Papua New Guinea and uh, that's exactly the, uh, you know, the what, how, and why concept with the three circles in between. And uh, I, I thought that was kind of, you know, kind of hit the head on the, on, uh, you know, pretty, pretty good when I was uh, trying to transition out of the military and into the kind of a civilian kind of servant kind of role. But, uh, you know, I, I, I you know, I, I have, I've had, obviously had some thought about it and uh, over the, over the last five years and I've had, you know, some, obviously I agree with it. You have to have a, you, everyone has to be on the same page, but that way in an organization, um, you know, you need to know why. And obviously the concept makes sense. I think uh, tying in MLK with the Wright brothers, with uh, Steve Jobs, it was a huge stretch, you know, those three things. I don't think I've ever thought of those three, uh, you know, groups of people together and uh, the concepts, but it's not quite as simple as he put it, you know, put it that way. You know, uh, it's not, it's not as simple. Obviously there's a lot of luck involved. There's a lot of other things that are involved with the success of those people. And to simply say that it was simply that, uh, the, that is a simple reason why all three of those are successful was a little bit of a far stretch. I personally like uh, Simon Sinek's other TED Talks on uh, on servant leadership. Uh, he has a real good one about uh, the military, and uh, you know, especially he talks about uh, you know talking to a group of special forces guys, and you know, the last one to get on the helicopter is always uh, you know going to be the team leader, the the first last person to eat, the first person through the door in a you know gunfight is going to be that leader. You know, it just it's just kind of an interesting role that he talked about, and he kind of uses that to kind of apply to corporate kind of business concepts and. I, you know, I think a lot of success, especially that was mentioned earlier, you know, the guy who's digging the, you know, the telephone poles is now up at the top. I think it really takes that, that leader to get their hands dirty. And I think applying that to Rotary, you know, like it's interesting because, you know, everyone talks about these hands-on projects and really getting our hands dirty. And there's even a lot of uh, uh, potentially even a lot of criticism on, on some, on some of our projects that we aren't getting our hands dirty. We aren't getting in there. We aren't, uh, um, you know, and it's a simple task. And it's, I think, I think having a combination of uh, kind of all three, I guess, if you want to call it, uh, you know, the white collar kind of uh, um, projects, the 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 blue collar projects, and and I guess the educational projects. I don't really call the educational projects in any of those categories. So I think all three of those types of projects, we kind of uh, uh, we need to have a have a balance of those, you know. And I think uh, clubs that are successful are going to have a balance of those. But I think their leaders need to be balanced. I think that's kind of the take home I got from uh, Simon Sinek overall. But uh, I, I definitely appreciate the uh, the rewatch of that uh, um, what, how, why concept because I definitely kind of had, uh, you know, it brought back some good memories, but also kind of let me kind of think about how I could apply it to my club because I never really thought about how I could apply those concepts to my specific Rotary Club. So thank you, Carol. That's cool. Thank you, James. Thank you very much for sharing. Uh, Mariko, do you have something to share? Um, well, uh I also thought about this and why in, in the middle of that, those in circles, because it reminded me of some webinar that we were supposed to take as an AG and before we, we became AG, that was something about the adult learning. And that webinar men you know, uh, mentioned about importance of why in, you know, when adults learn, you know, we have to know why we are learning this. And then so I, that, so, so it resonated me with that. And then, so I, I try to do this in as much as possible. For instance, you know, right now, I think, you know, the um, 
grant management workshop is going on right right now. And when I talk about that grant workshop, you know, I, I, I tell to my presidents and the PEs, look, do you know why this is so important? You know, we just tend to say, okay, two people have to come. This is not necessary to, to, you know, for you to get the money. But I think we have to go you know, one, one um, layer up you know, saying, look, this will help Rotary uh, as a credible you know, a four star or five star in the charity navigator. And that will really help Rotary to get more funding. And that because everybody trusts, you know, the, that Rotary is managing the money um, as they, you know, as the trusted um, uh, nonprofit. So, uh, you know, this why, you know, in a different level is very important. That's my takeaway. Thank you. Very good, Mariko. Thank you for sharing. Um, Lane, how about you? You got a thumbs up, buddy. Share with us. Uh, yeah, um, you know, there, Simon Sinek with the Golden Circle was great. Um, you know, like James was saying, but you know, the one, the one video was pretty cool. Was um, trying to um, that lollipop moment. You know, that video was pretty cool. We're making leadership bigger than us and more powerful than us, and. I really have to think about this lollipop moment for a while. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I came up with was, I'll tell you a quick story. You know, my son, he's 14 now, right? He's a teenager. But uh, in my house, when I leave the house, I have to walk up these stairs and then I have to come down these long stairs. So when I'm walking up the stairs and I leave, you know, my son goes by, you know, he's six, seven, eight. And he runs up the stairs to the second level and he can see me as I walk up the stairs and he'll always open up the, the curtains and he'll open up the window and he said, bye daddy, I love you. And every time I'm leaving, he'll always run up to say bye to me again, right? And um, fast forward to 14, he's 14 now, teenager. He has to be cool. He's got his hair, it's all dyed now. He's lifting weights. I'm like, yeah, you're looking good, buddy. And now he runs up the stairs as a 14 year old <laughs> and he does the same thing and he opens the window. He goes, bye dad. It's dad now. It's not daddy. It's dad. It's cool though. It's cool. So I was like, bye dad. I love you. And I think to myself, like, what, why did that happen? You know, like how, how do we have this relationship? And, you know, I, I think to myself, if I can't do it at home, being a good leader to my son, then where can I, I can't even do it anywhere, right? How can I be a good leader? And if I, if I can't be a good servant leader to him, so the one thing that I took away from is, you know, <clears throat> whenever I promised him I was gonna play a game with him, a video game, um, I made sure I never, ever, ever broke that promise. Um, no matter how busy I was, I would just do it because I made that promise, you know, I'm gonna play a board game with you, I'm gonna do it. I'm there, I made that promise with you. And I think the one things that really helped um, make me reflect on Rotary is with our members and the people that become members, but eventually become your friends and they become your family. Um, whenever I promise them that, hey, I'm gonna be there for you, I'm there. Yeah. Uh, you need to talk, I'm there. And I think that Rotary has really helped me with that. You know, and Rotary has given me a lot back. So. I think my lollipop moment is just that, you know, just helping our members and being there for them and being being thankful that I can be there for them to help them because we got so much wonderful people in Rotary and everyone on this call are, are just great people and I'm just so happy to know you all, so. Great, Lane, thank you so much. Boy, you guys are so good. So this is our last one. I want you to take a moment and I want you to think about somebody that you've worked with that you think absolutely was an amazing leader. What I want you to do in the chat box now is I want you to write that person's name down and a reason why that person was an amazing leader. Okay, so go ahead and go to the chat box. I'll just give you another minute. And then
then I'm going to ask Scott to help me because I don't see the chat box. So Scott, you're going to be able to tell me what you see. Okay, let's get back together. Scott, can you help me out here? Okay, so I'm jumping in here. I'm gonna start with, looks like Lane is Stacy Rogers. He always told me what Dick said. People won't care about you until they know how much you care. Great. Uh, moving right along, Conrad, EK, I used to work at a bank. My colleague Herman is a leader. He listened more than spoke. Excellent. Uh, then there's me. I've said Josh Powell, the CEO at the company that I work for, and keeps it positive and never goes negative. Uh, Doug Adams, uh, his pastor and why willingness to be vulnerable while leading. Dave Hamill. Brad Kraus, co-founder of Kinkos, always was positive and encouraging to others. Uh, Lane, also, he fought cancer three times and survived, but always had time for his two daughters. Excellent. Mariko, Dr. Sadako Ogata, um, late UNHCR head. She told me to try waters that I'm not used to. Uh, Ted, a boss years ago at a computer company, great communicator and team leader to bring us together and empower us to make difficult decisions and take action. Uh, Dick, uh, Mary Afuku, a counselor who led our Interact. She was loved, admired, and followed for her humility and enthusiasm. Wow. Put others first, and she always listened. <laughs> and then James wrote this because I'm reading. <laughs> Scott Wishart, he definitely listens, and he has an amazing selection of sparkling waters. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, James. I appreciate that. <laughs> I remember uh, those, yeah. <laughs> Kelly, um, who? David Worthington. Why? <clears throat> he was... Veterans Outreach Coordinator at ASU, when I taught there, always listened, shared, willing to help and support others, and read from behind. Never wanted accolades, but is committed to serving those who have given much. Sean Slentz, my high school cross-country coach. Michael Jackson, not the pop singer. I wasn't the fastest or best runner, but he made time for me when my folks divorced helped me through a very tough time as, high, as a high school senior. Mm -hmm. David Livingston, so many wonderful leaders in the YMCA, Rotary, Navy League. But as a kid, Ray, Ray Mosinek uh, was an inspiration when I was 12, allowed me the opportunity to earn the right to read all the comic books I could for free as long as I helped him around the store. Now a 7-Eleven was a stop and go. <laughs> he <in> marketing. <laughs> Dick and lean for service and scotch with a smile. That looks like it's about it. Unless anybody's got some late ones they want to chime in with. Well, I, I, th I think you guys, you have done such a great job today. It's been fun for me. I did enjoy this, I'm going to tell you. Um, I want to thank you all for your openness and for your honesty. And I wish you my very best as you continue your journey through leadership with Rotary. Thank you very much. Thanks Bye. for your leadership. Thank you so much, Carol. What a great, and you got it all in the time. I know you had a pack session and we're running a little late. Thank you so much. One more round of applause <laughs> for Carol. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, just some um, 
some reminders. The new assignments, I'm going to be getting it out to you for the next session, which is membership. I'll be getting those out to you shortly. I want to remind you to reach out to your mentors if you haven't already. We actually had a session with mentors this week, and I know um, most, most of you have re reached out, and the mentors have been saying great things about you, so thank you. Um, what I'm doing is, again, I'm going to remind you, I have we have our web page, so I try to put everything up on there. I'm starting another um, subcategory of recommended reading since we're getting, Carol gave us a great one. Um, and I have, so I have the two from today on there, but if you have a recommended reading that you want me to put on there, I know Lane has like a lot of recommended readings. Um, thanks for the links, Lane. And um, and I, that's all the, the, the announcements I have, but I'm gonna give it to Naomi in case you have a wrap up announcement. No, but I think Kelly was trying to show us something. I'll, I'll put the book, I'll send the book in the chat for uh, Wendy to add to our oh, recommended right. reading. So it's my weekend read. Awesome. Yeah. And we're glad we can hear you now, Kelly. Do you want to share your quote real quick? I know you put in the chat. Now, now it's not going to work. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, any last words or any one, I think we can take one question or two questions from, uh, for Carol. If not, I'm going to read for you. Kelly's um, uh, quote was, the task for the leader is to get the people from where they are to where they have not been. Henry Kissinger and then Dave Livingston also had what um, wrote grandpa told me at age 12 there are three kinds of people in the world people who make things happen people who watch things happen and people who wonder what happened which one were you right now not sure where the original quote, quote came from I've always attributed it to my grandfather so thank you grandpa um, so if there's nothing else I want I know how busy we all are um, I'm gonna I'm gonna let everyone go um, but again, thank you so much on behalf of Naomi and Benson and Carol and uh, we are grateful for you making the time but we're also just so excited to see you be interested in being the next leaders of our district. So thank you very much. Happy Saturday. Have a very good weekend. Thanks guys. Bye. And we have, we have the grant management webinar now going for another half an hour if you want to jump on to that Zoom. But thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Carol. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Carol. Nice to see everybody. Yeah, thank you, Carol. Thank you guys. Thank you for coming. Nice seeing you guys. Yeah.